Hi, we're in the neighborhood sharing the good news of Jehovah. Do you have a moment? <coughs> Without question, the Jehovah's Witness faith should be regarded as a cult. They are not a Christian organization. However, there is one point that should be noted, and that is this, that you can be, a person could possibly be a Jehovah's Witness or part of the Jehovah's Witness and still be a Christian. Here's how. Being a Jehovah's Witness does not necessarily mean that you know everything about what the whole organization entails. Just like being a Christian doesn't necessarily mean that all Christians understand what the tenets of Christianity are. No faith can, can make that claim that all of their adherents understand what's going on in that particular group. The same, is, the same holds true with Jehovah's Witnesses. So there are some, it's possible that there are some who have come to a trusting faith in Christ, yet don't fully understand what's going on in the Jehovah's Witness group. Uh, this is an organization that is ran by the Watchtower Bible Track Society, a group that calls itself the mouthpiece of God. However, uh, a closer look will find out that they are anything but a mouthpiece of God. In order to kind of see what they're about to get a good understanding of Jehovah's Witnesses, you have to first start with the founding of the group. That was by a man by the name of Charles Taze Russell, who by any account would be categorized as a snake oil salesman. This guy was not a good man whatsoever. He was a person who, who uh, believed or at least spoke about how there are no good churches, there are no uh, Christian organizations left. All of the world has gone into apostasy and so it was up to him to kind of usher in God's true word. Well, the reason why you would call this person a snake oil salesman is because he literally was that. He was going around the countryside selling what, what he claimed to farmers to be the seed for miracle wheat. Well, anytime you have someone out there making these ridiculous claims, you're going to have someone, at least in those days, uh, you're going to have some journalists who are going to challenge him. And so he had in his side a thorn by the name of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. This was a newspaper that called him on his claims about this miracle wheat, but also made it a point to mention how inerrant his doctrine was biblically. Well, Charles Russell did not take to that kindly, and so he would he filed a suit against them, claiming that the newspaper was defaming him. And because of his lawsuit, then naturally a uh, a court proceeding would take place. The good part about a court proceeding, though, is that there are transcripts to kind of help us to see what happened. One of the things that came out in the court process was Charles Russell's lack of understanding of the Bible. Now, we need to back up for a second. This is an organization that believes that God's true name is Jehovah and we ought to call him that out of respect, that it's sinful not to call him Jehovah. Well, a couple of things. One, we're not sure if the V sound is an accurate sound at the beginning of Hebrew, now there are some, some scholars who debate that point, so I won't really get into that, but what we do know for a fact is that the J sound is absent in Hebrew as well as Greek. The J sound is a, is a sound that comes around a little later uh, in the next several centuries, introduced primarily, we think, by German scholars who try to compensate by adding the J to what they think is the correct pronunciation of his name, Yahweh, now, we don't even know if that's the correct sound of his name because Jews did not, or Hebrew, did not have it, or does not have any vowels, and nor did the Masorites give it any vowels when they maintained the, uh, uh, the Jewish text. So where they get this term Jehovah, and to state that that's the name that we ought to call him, we just don't know. Uh, it's okay to call him Jehovah, that's not, that's not the problem, but to state that it is a sin to not call him that, well, there's no basis for that. More than that, this is an organization that states that they understand the, and they have the true translation of the Bible. You have heard it talked about many times, no doubt, about how they handle the character and the deity of Jesus. 
they deny that he is the true God, they would put him in the category of a God. Now we're going to look and see if that makes biblical sense and we're going to do so using their scriptures. Here is an organization, here is a man that claims to have the right interpretation of scriptures. However, we're going to find out that he didn't even understand the languages that were used that our English versions were derived from. He didn't understand Hebrew or Greek, though he had bragged and boasted as though he was a Hebrew and Greek scholar. Well, on the stand during his lawsuit against this newspaper, the question was asked, do you understand, can you read Greek? Well, to maintain his facade, he answered the question as to whether he understood and could read Greek. He answered say, stating that he could read and understand Greek. Well, so what would any lawyer do as a follow-up question? They would give him uh, a Greek text to read. And so they gave him the Greek text, and it may have been the book of John. I'm not sure, but I believe that's what it was. They gave him the book of John to read, and of course, he was found to be a fraud. He could not read it. Well, thinking that maybe this might be too difficult of a task, maybe at least because he's got all this pressure on the stand, they offered him something easier to read. They gave him the Greek alphabet. He still could not read that, and so he was forced to admit on the stand in court that he had lied about being able to read and understand Greek or Hebrew. Well, why is that important? Well, when you tell everyone that our interpretation, our translation of the Greek and Hebrew scriptures are incorrect and yours are correct, well, now we see that, no, we, we can't trust your word. You can't even read the text yourself. And so you are in no position to tell anyone else how they are in error when it comes to their translations. This is a man who had multiple affairs with his wife. And so after a divorce and the court had ruled that he owed, I think it was about 20 something thousand in alimony, he got around that by taking all of his assets and pushing it into the coffers of the Watchtower Society. I'm not sure how that actually ended, but that's the kind of man that we were, that, 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 that we're dealing with here. This is the kind of person who is the founder. This is the founder of this organization. So if the foundation is rotten, if the foundation is shaky, what does that say about everything else that's built on top of it? Now, because we're not doing a really exhaustive study on the Jehovah's Witnesses, we're not going to be able to cover all of the things that they believe. They believe some wild things such as Jesus being uh, Michael the Archangel. Well, that doesn't even make sense, even according to their own scriptures. If you just simply look at Hebrews 1, 5, we find this. To which one of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? Today I have become your father. So even in their own translations, God is saying that I've never called any angel, let alone Michael, uh, my son. And so that holds no water. But one of the biggest things that the Jehovah's Witnesses has against the rest of Christianity, or I should say the other way around, and the reason why we treat it as a cult is because of how they handle Jesus and his deity. They deny that Jesus is God. And so when you encounter a Jehovah's Witness, there's a couple of things you need to be prepared to deal with. One, many of them are indoctrinated to the point to where they may not be willing to hear you or wanting to hear you. So you've got to first determine if they are willing to do so. I'm going to give you a couple of questions to ask to kind of proceed forward. These are some things that I used to use, uh, but you'll also see why I don't really spend a lot of time dealing with them unless I come across one who I can tell, or at least seems that they might be open to hearing the text. What's the old saying? A man convinced against his will is really not convinced. And that's what you're going to find a lot of times when dealing with people like Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Mormons, should we do so? Sure, we should always, as, as Peter says, always be ready to give a defense of the hope that's in us. And so we also want to be guilty of sharing the gospel to people who just don't know the gospel, and that would include Jehovah's Witnesses. But as I said before, there, are, there, there may be someone in the Jehovah's Witness faith who believe in Jesus like we do, but may not quite understand all the tenets. And so I've got a couple of questions that I that I kind of use that may be helpful to you. The first question is this. One, since I'm willing to be wrong, if you can show me something that proves that I'm wrong, I'm willing to listen to it. I'm willing to, to address it. So my question to them is this. If I can show you something, 
using your own scriptures that demonstrate that you might be wrong, would you be willing to listen? If their answer is no, then there's no further reason to talk because again, we're going nowhere. We'll just go back and forth for no good reason. Unless maybe there's someone in the audience, someone around who is genuinely interested and may be struggling and you want to, to defend the faith, that's fine also. But if it's just the two of you, or maybe in their case, they have two against one, it may be a fruitless exercise. But if they answer yes, and they're likely to answer yes, then you can go ahead and proceed forward because if they're willing to listen, or at least they say they're willing to listen or to address whatever they think might be wrong, now you've got a starting point. Now you've got some common ground. That doesn't mean that they're really going to listen. And so here's where the second question comes in. The second question is this, do you believe that lying is wrong? Is lying a sin? Well, what Jehovah's Witness is not going to say that yes, lying is wrong and lying is a sin. Even atheists, even people who don't believe in God believe that lying is wrong and lying is a sin. And so if lying is wrong and lying is a sin, when we show them something that they can't refute and they don't want to address it, then the next question has got to be is, I thought you told me that you'd be willing to address it. And you said that lying is a sin. So, and so when we come to a, to a passage that refutes their understanding and they're not willing to hear it, then we're going to remind them that you said initially that you would be willing to at least address uh, or listen to what seems to be an apparent uh, error. And you told me that lying is a sin. So you need to at least be honorable to your word. I will be honorable to mine if you can show me where I'm wrong. So we want to deal with, like many others, we want to deal with the easiest thing to show their error, and that is the deity of Christ. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is not God. Now, according to our scriptures, we believe that he is. As a matter of fact, we don't believe it. We know so. They have decided to mangle the translations and to cause their New World translations to read the way that justifies their doctrine. So we're familiar with John 1, 1, where it says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, but they were translated as the word was a God. In Greek, there is no indefinite article. You would just simply have the word um, by itself. So if you want to say a cat, a dog, you would just have the word that represents dog. If you want to say a brother, you would say Adelphos, and that would be it. But they take that to an extreme. And so when we look in John 1, 1, when it says, uh, the third portion of it, it says, Caiaphas ain't halagas, they take that, uh, the Caiaphas, because there is no definite article in front of Theos, the word God, because there is the word the is not there, they would take it as that it is to be rendered as a God. Well, that's just bad Greek grammar. And I hope I don't lose you, but let me try to explain this real briefly and then we'll move on. There are two nouns in this passage, the word, the word for God and the word for word. Both of those are nouns. The question is, which one of those nouns is the subject? Any Greek scholar, any Greek scholar would be able to tell you that halagas is identifiable as the subject. So the word is the subject. The other noun the, uh, for God is what's called the predicate nominative. What that simply means is that the word belongs to a category of theos, meaning that the word belongs to the category of God. The word is God, which is why it says kai theos ain halagos, which is, and God was the word, or we translate it uh, better in English, and the word was God. The problem that Jehovah's Witnesses have is that when we go further down, we see their inconsistencies in verse six. Read this with me. In English, it says there was a man sent from God whose name was John. In Greek, it says apestomenos paratheu. Apestomenos is being sent from, para is from, then it says theu, that's God. What's missing here is the definite article. There is no word the there. So their line of consistency would say that it should be rendered being sent from a God. Now, the reason why they don't have this same consistent line of thinking here is because this text, verse six, doesn't affect their doctrine that Jesus is not God. 
verse one does. And so they deal with that. But if they're going to be consistent, they would have to do the same thing in verse six. They're not interested in being consistent. They're interested in proving their point and indoctrinating people and then having more to add to their cult. And I say cult, and I'm not I'm 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 hesitant to use that word oftentimes, but this categorizes them, this classif this classification of them being a cult is earned. We're gonna see that in just a second. So the first line of questioning would be this: Who raised Jesus from the dead? Well, according to the Jehovah's Witnesses, and I won't give you all the scriptures, I won't read the scriptures for you, I'll just put the scriptures up so that you can go and read them. But in the New World Translation, God is the one who raised Jesus according to Acts 2.32. But then according to John 2, Jesus is the one who raises himself from the dead. But then what about the Holy Spirit? Well, according to the New World Translation, as well as our translations, Romans 8 tells us the Holy Spirit raises Jesus from the dead. So Houston, Watchtower, we have a problem because you can't say that God is the one that raised him from the dead when your own scriptures tell you that Jesus raised himself from the dead as well as the Holy Spirit. How can that be? Now, we know the, we know what the truth is. The way it's reconciled is that, that uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they exist eternally as one, though they are distinct. But the Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you that Jesus is not God. Well, so the next question would be, is Jehovah the Almighty God? Well, they would say yes. And in Isaiah 45, 5, their scriptures in the New World Translations will tell you that God declares that he is God. Apart from him, there are there is no other God. He's the only God. So there is no other God. However, John 1, you just told us in your passages that Jesus is a God. Well, if Jesus is a God and God or Jehovah is Almighty God, what do we do with Isaiah when he tells us that uh, about this child that's going to be born and what his name will be called, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God? Well, wait a second, even more of a problem because your own scriptures are bearing this out that Jesus, in fact, is God, or at least Almighty God. In the New World Translations, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and tongue confess. The same can be said about God in the Old Testament. In the New World Translations, God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. But in the New World Translations, in Revelations, Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. Well, what is it? So when you ask them this question, and granted, there are far more passages that we can go to. But so when you ask them these questions, ask them, does that seem to be a problem? And if they're going to be honest and true to their word, they're going to say, well, that needs to be addressed. They're likely not to turn from the Jehovah's Witness faith at that point because they have been so indoctrinated that they are reliant upon the Watchtower Society to give them their marching orders, which is why I tell you that they are a cult. This is a group, this is an organization that has throughout the centuries given numerous false prophecies regarding the end of the world. The latest being 1975, they've also done so, I believe, in 1925, 1914, 1874, and a few other times in between there, times where they said that the, the Jesus' millennial reign has already begun. Uh, I believe 1925, they spoke that uh, through the Watchtower that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will come and physically rule and reign on the earth. The problem with giving these predictions is that while when you're giving them, you're gonna get a boost in, in uh, attendance, you're gonna get a, a boost in people joining, but when the date comes and goes, you're gonna have a huge falling away. You're gonna have a lot of people leaving because wait, we found out that you were wrong. And what does Deuteronomy say about a, a prophet that's whose words don't come true? So when it comes to dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses, remember the people themselves aren't necessarily representative of the organization. The organization is built upon lies, deceit, deception. There are some though who may legitimately be seeking the truth. And so when you come across them, as, as Peter said, always be ready to give a defense to those that ask you. Sanctify Christ in your heart and always be ready to ask them or answer them. That doesn't mean that you're gonna know everything. And so when you come across someone uh, in the Jehovah's Witness faith, 
and they ask you questions and you may not have the answer to, it's okay to say, I don't know. Would you be willing to come back when I find the answer? Um, and that doesn't mean that you can't also bring somebody there with you. If they have somebody with them, then so be it. But it's okay for you to also have somebody with you. There's no rules that say that you can't have one or two more people with you to give you a better answer or understanding. So be careful when you deal with them because it's not likely, not impossible, but it's not likely that you're going to turn them, but make sure that they don't put you in a, in a position to where you look ungodly, where you get frustrated. There are plenty of people there out there who need to hear the gospel, who are not being pulled in by a cult. But we all still have this one issue to deal with, whether we are um, born again believers, whether we are not, whether a person is in the Jehovah's Witness faith, whether someone is a Mormon or, or a Muslim. We all are dealing with Satan's attacks. And so we want to be mindful when we go out and share the gospel and love that we're going to deal with this from time to time. Now, this question came from one of the subscribers who asked a question about Jehovah's Witnesses. And so if any of you have any questions, simply uh, leave them in the comment section, send an email. And then what I will do is I will respond either through the comments, through an email, or in this case, with a video. So I want to thank you all. Uh, until we meet again, be smart uh, and be a smart Christian.